morning. Welcome back to Reefer Pro Tips with me, your host, Anne, and disembodied hands, Quindy, Justin, and John. How are you all? How's the internet? I didn't check it before I got on. Oh, big storm, huh? Yeah, you have to dig all your doglets out of the snow, dog father. <laughs> Hello. Sorry for the late start, guys. I got a little bit of a little bit laggy this morning. New hot water heater. Ooh, toasty. Good, 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 good. Awesome. I like to hear that. Comcast heard my threats. It's very misty here today. We had a big fog this morning, which is uh, not, it's like, it happens, but it's pretty rare. I've seen a few. I see a couple every winter. So it's very misty out. Hello, hello. <clears throat> All right. Well then. Hmm. Hmm. Let's do some quick leather and then some NMM. Oh, except, okay, I do. Whew, I thought perhaps I had uh, put my rich leather in the other room, but I was smart this time and I remembered to bring it back. All right, so leather and gold because I want to get some more on this, uh, on the flames around there. And we're almost done with this guy. Like crazy, like we're, we could finish today. I just have a couple of things I need to decide. I need to figure out, we need to do that skull there. So that's actually going to be probably gold. Let's get this guy in focus. Hopefully that took, yeah. So we need to do that skull there. Um, we need to do the chain, which is going to be in silver. We need to figure out colors for this little scabbard and the hilt. I'm thinking I may make the hilt orange and the scabbard blue. Um, to echo what I've got going on back here. I actually only have a little bit of blue on this model right now. Um, we also, he's got some claws up there that I didn't get around his necklace. He's got, this is time to make a list. It's time to make a list, everybody. We're so close to the model. We're finally at our ending list. Hold on, let me grab that. So sticky note, ending list. So bone claws around neck. Leather, dagger, scabbard, and hilt. Uh, and then we've got the canteen and chain and skull. Those are all near each other, so I'm just going to put them all on one line because that's easily easy to see that they're all kind of together. Um, quiver, or sorry, scroll case. I didn't put a color on that. I probably should make it orange. So we'll do more orange today then. Uh, and then, yeah, and then it's just, let's make sure, oh, the cuff there. Leather, pouch, cuff. Hmm. Everything else looks pretty good. I haven't really done his eyes eyes we're still kind of glowing glowing eyes at this point um and that's it then just uh finish freehand and touch up cape highlights all right that is quite a list so we do have a little bit here David also suggested I should put a gold um, gold uh, rim on the teal here so I can look at, I can block, kind of put that down as a final thing, gold on teal cloth. If I do it though, I don't think I'm going to do it right at the edge. I think I'm going to do it like up a bit to bring it around. Um, that'll let me do it uninterrupted because the hem of his cloak is really torn up. This one's torn up too, and I went for the edge anyway, but I think I want it a little different up here if I do it. So, Hem Fontana, thank you for the resub. 28 months, dang. Contractors call this a punch list? Yeah, this is like, this is so smart when you're getting down to the end. Otherwise, you will forget. I would totally have forgotten the claws around his neck if I hadn't done that double check. Like, no question. 
Because especially with a model like this, I think it's important. When you've got a very complex model and you've been working on big areas, but they're just little things, it's so easy to miss those little things as you get to the end. Also, honestly, if you're, if you're like me, um, it's so satisfying to cross off all of these things off my list as I finish them. And then it gives me a clear, um, a clear path to completing the model so that I don't just kind of feel overwhelmed and like tired and like sick of the model. Um, instead, I've got this little list I can just work down and when I'm done, I'm done. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, yeah, M March, March for paint orders. I mean, it's gonna be warmer in, March will be warmer in Texas for sure. But as far as up north, hopefully it won't be quite so frozen. I mean, the, Hello, Cajun Beauty. Um, but yeah, so yeah, paint shipping in the winter, always kind of fraught, especially if you're in the frozen north. So just, I like the closer you are to like the freezing point, as far as like when you're below freezing, you definitely don't want to order paint. When you're right around freezing, when you're in the 30s, you know, you're probably okay as long as Texas isn't freezing. Um, just because if you can catch that window, it, it takes a while for paint to freeze solid. It takes a while. So as long as you're hovering in the thirties and forties, you're going to be just fine. You just don't want it to be in the teens, uh, or the twenties. So yeah, so you can take your chances if Texas is a bit warmer and if your state is right around in the thirties Fahrenheit. Um, but, uh, when you get colder, that's when it gets risky and when I wouldn't do it. So yes, so we've just made, as, as Pendrake points out, we have just made our punch list, our list of things that we still need to do on this model. Um, also, just to kind of a note also, if you, if you like to do lists, the concept, but you feel that like after a few things crossed off, it just gets to be messy and then you feel kind of like disheartened again, um, I will redraw my list. Like if I get to that point where, I, where I'm crossed off a bunch of stuff and it's kind of hard to read, I will just rewrite the last few things on the list on a new note and I'll just go that way. And it tends to refresh my brain and, and say, oh, look, you only have a few things left and, and get me to that point. So I just put up for my $10 backers and uh, on my Patreon, 10 and $15 level. I just put up a thing yesterday that I really love that is about avoiding, like getting back from burnout, avoiding burnout, getting back from it, getting back to um, kind of evaluating yourself as to why you aren't painting. If you want to paint more, but you're just not doing it for some reason, there's a bunch of like kind of stuff that your brain is probably pulling on you. And I've gone through all of this, every single example I use in this PDF and it's like eight pages. It's long. Um, every single example, I, every struggle that, that is in this PDF, I have personally gone through. So every one of these, I'm speaking from direct experience and what helped me, what worked for me. So Hopefully you guys enjoy it. I loved writing it, so humor me. <laughs> we'll go back to techniques and stuff next month. Okay, okay, okay. Let's get our, at least start, let's start with our leather. Let's get that hand taken care of in the pouch. Um, this little, uh, little leather wrap around the canteen. Oh, what happens? Oh, it's the chemistry. So what it does, uh, Raven Day, is because paint is water-based, at least our paint is, any water-based paint is this way, by the way. Um, every water-based paint on the planet has a big label on its base saying, do not freeze. The reason is because it's water-based, the water's gonna freeze. When the water freezes, it forces all the resins and pigments and um, surfactants and you know matting agents, it forces all those out of solution. That's the, that's what it does. That's the simple way to put it. So you end up with frozen water and like sludge and the sludge will also slowly freeze, but the water freezes a lot easier. And so it'll just push everything out. And once you've got everything out of solution, the only way to get it back is to put it in like, like a cut, like a, a real, real, uh, mixer, like a real, like high grade lab mixer and get it in there. The, essentially the same sort of mixer that put the resins in solution with the water in the first place. Um, and your Vortex mixer ain't cutting it. So essentially it's just not comebackable. Some bases will actually go to powder as they freeze. I've seen this happen, depending on how deep the freeze is. Um, I think only one of our bases, it, it tends to be bases that are higher in acrylic, that are a lot more watery and higher in acrylic is what it tends to do. But yeah. 
Yeah, and the reason it turns to cottage cheese is that that cottage cheese, the clumpy stuff, that's the stuff, that's all the stuff that got forced out of the solution earliest and it clumped together and you're just not going to get it back. Like you can mix it with your brush and try to make it go back, but notice how it falls out right away again. Like that's because your brush is not sufficient force. It's, it's not sufficient force to put everything back. So the quick answer is don't, don't let your, don't order paint during a deep freeze. Wait, wait until things are like in the 30s and look at the intervening states and kind of see when the whole country is around 30s and 40s in the winter, you're pretty safe at that point. Pretty safe because no matter where your paint might get stuck on a truck overnight, it's probably not going to freeze solid if it's like 36. But if it's 23, then you're in trouble. So the other way to avoid this is um, if, if things in like in Denton and in your area are uh, at least a bit above freezing is to honestly do it like second day air where it's going to go on a plane and go a lot more directly um, and a lot more quickly instead of going ground. So that's the ways to deal around. Oh yeah, you tell your husband, per the paint chemistry lady, it is a real thing. And if he and if he wonders about it, go to Lowe's or to Home Depot and look at the paint, you know, the gallons of house paint they have in there that are water-based. On the back of each of them, you will see it huge letters usually do not freeze. And that's the reason. One water-based paint is much alike another water-based paint. Yes, insert signature look of told you so. Exactly. Yeah, those people. <laughs> those people who wear shorts in the winter. Like, I, I knew those people in Wisconsin. I was like, total skeptical look here. So I'm going with my old uh, standby russet brown for this uh, these leather bits. I don't want them to go too dark because I've already got black and dark blue up here. So I'm going to be bringing up this leather, but I also want it to be kind of neutral. There's so many colors on this already. We really don't want to mess with it. So any more colors and we've got the Kaleidoscope Warlock of Doom. And so I'm going with a, with a true neutral and I'm going to kind of um, even blend it out a little bit by bringing it up with my favorite combo. This is actually an opportunity actually for me to use my favorite combo uh, for dark leather, which is mixing driftwood brown into my russet brown. These colors, even though driftwood is so muted, it actually does create a beautiful soft kind of on the dark side brown leather. So yeah, you may get lucky, you may not. Essentially try to rescue the box as fast as you can when it arrives at your house, Val. Don't leave it on the porch if you can avoid it. But yeah, sometimes you get lucky because sometimes if there's enough other stuff in the box, it'll kind of cushion it long enough to keep it from freezing. Once again, it takes time for paint to freeze solid. So I'm gonna do a 50-50 mix straight up and then I'm gonna go up to pure driftwood, but I'll put a brush full of my previous color in it. So we got that. Yeah, it depends on your local temps. It always depends. Hi, Bob and Julie. Yeah, we're talking about freezing paint and I made a punch list because I'm really close to done on this model. So we've got like our list of the things that we need to do to finish it. Um, always a good idea in my opinion because otherwise you forget. <laughs> okay, I forget, it just drops out of my brain. My brain goes to lunch and uh, the, the little things get missed. So now the great thing about this is that I can also just work from this when I go for the bone up here um, and just like mix up some bleached linen base coat with this color and hit them with bleached linen and they'll be fine. When you've got tiny little, he's got tiny little claws on a necklace around his neck. When you've got little tiny stuff like that, you can see them there. Um, you don't need much more than a base and a highlight and lining around it. It's already got lining around it, so it already has a shadow. Lining in that case of very small items is definitely the shadow. And then your base coat and then your highlight, boom, you're done. Anything tiny, any of this little string on his, on his uh, pouch, same thing. Make sure it's lined, do a base coat on it, do a highlight wherever the light would hit, and you're done. Unless it's a shiny thing, then you have to bring it up to white. <laughs> Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. 
Yeah, it is really that simple. You guys, uh, paint chemistry is, is definitely not rocket science. Like a lot of the stuff, once you hear it, it makes perfect sense because water-based paint is this weird amalgamation of like particles that have been convinced to suspend themselves permanently in water or semi-permanently. But freezing, a change in chemical state, can absolutely push those things out of solution because the water will freeze faster. It'll crystallize. It'll push all that stuff out. Um, some stuff will kind of stay in solution and that's why your paint doesn't separate into clear water and, and solids. Um, it's cause you know, it depends like halfway through the freezing process, maybe the stuff that's in solution starts to freeze also, but that's what happens. Like, and that, and it makes sense if you think about it. Um, plastics aren't going to freeze solid as necessarily as quickly as water will start to freeze. And so and when they do freeze, nothing will really happen to the resins. They just fall out of solution, you know. So plastic can get brittle when it freezes, but these resins are typically a bit softer. Um, and likewise, soft plastic can crack when it freezes. But when you're dealing with a, a tiny little, you know, smaller than a micron level, then it really, that really isn't a thing you see. What you see is the difference in solution. Um, and they just won't hold together. They'll, they'll clump but they won't like actually like they'll be compromised essentially but yeah but it's not like it's uh it is it is very commonsensical paint why paint acts the way it does and how it acts the way it does once you learn the basics it makes a lot of sense it's very it's it's in, intuitively i found it easy to grasp when i was working um at reaper like i was actually surprised at how common sense the actions of paint were so I'm just going to thin these, I think, four to one to start. This is unusual. Uh, probably a little bit more on the driftwood. Well, I guess two. All right, all right. Whenever I add, the driftwood does not have a ton of white in it, but it does have white, so it will be a little bit more opaque. But yeah, freezing paint is, sadly, it's one of those things where we can't tell you not to order paint in the winter. Like, we're just not going to do that because plenty of climates are just fine. Um, you're above freezing and, you know, all pretty much almost all the south is, is tends to stay above freezing for the majority of the winter or hover right around it. And usually, like I said, that's not going to have a huge, like, as long as your paint doesn't get sat out on a doorstep for a day, it's not going to have a big deal. Um, and even then, if it's like 34 degrees, it's still not going to necessarily have a, a big impact. But when you're sub-zero, it can. And again, again, it's it's like a roll of the dice. It depends on, on how the paint travels. It depends on how long it sits out on your porch. All that stuff. So you can still get lucky ordering in the winter. But all, every winter we do get a, a number of returns from people who got their paint and it was bad. All right, I want I want focus right around here and I want close. Yeah, yes, yeah, Nomadzi, roll the dice, roll your save versus cold. Constitution save for your paint. But remember, just paint, water-based paint's not made to work like that. Like, technically, I have the little catch on that uh, pouch, too. But yeah, that nice warm brown color, notice it does show up very well against the blue and the teal behind it. And uh, that's nice. So it'll show up, but it's not going to be really distracting. You know, it kind of, it's dark. There, That's a dark color. This is a dark area. As I bring up highlights, you'll see details, which is great, but it shouldn't ever overwhelm the things around it. That's why I wouldn't make this a light color, this pouch. It's a nice detail, but it's not important. Maybe I'll make that catch silver since I have to do silver chain. Let me put, let me add this to my list. There. I don't want to forget it. Because I listed it under um, pouch, but 
But once I finish the leather on pouch, I'm going to forget to do that little catch. So little stuff like this. Yeah, yes. Yeah, David uh, David definitely uh, impacted that dice roller in ways we could not have foreseen. He denies it. He denies it. He has faith in the randomness, the randomness of the uh, of the dice roll. But we all are giving him the skeptical eyebrow for sure. He's in the frozen north right now, though. Or at least the frozen high altitude. He sent me pictures yesterday. It is very beautiful where he is. So I'm going to do just a highlight just on the higher parts of that. Uh, and then I'm going to come in with the driftwood brown and do a higher highlight. So I've just got two highlights, just enough to like bring out that little, you see how those little strings come out now. And I do need to mix up my liner color. I'm going to do walnut just because I feel like there's so much dark here. I want solid lines. Yeah, it doesn't work here, crows. Yeah, eight ball command here works. Although Quindy could probably set up a, a exclamation point D20 command here. It's kind of fun, Quindy. I don't know if Reaper has any command slots still open that they aren't using, and they probably prefer to use them for non-fun stuff, but if you feel inclined, I, I have found that the D20, um, exclamation point D20 is super fun. <laughs> yes, well, that's why we hate fun around here, exactly. Well, but it doesn't because Nomad Zeke, if you're in my channel, I, I put a delay on it so you can't spam it. So essentially when somebody does D20, it just rolls like it'll take the first person, but then it's like a five or 10 second gap. And that tends to uh, discourage uh, spam rolling. Yeah, I know Reaper just hates fun. I know, I know. I have personal experience with this. Oh, hey, I forgot. There's another leather thing down here. So now I've got my walnut mixed up so I can come up and do a little bit of shading here where the um, little lining, where the little tendrils hit the pouch. I just want a little bit of a definition there. So I'm going to add a shadow. Then we'll bring up the top of that pouch. Almost more, more impressive than rolling high. That's funny. All right, so first level of highlight is, again, it's a one-to-one -one mix of russet and driftwood brown. And then I'm going to bring a highlight down here on kind of the belly of the pouch, where I imagine it would bulge out a little bit. And the colors that I'm using after I mixed up that intermediate color, you can see what color that turns. It's a lot like earth brown, but it's a little less uh, grayed out, a little less yellowy. I just really like this soft neutral brown I get from this combo. It's still warm. It's still medium dark if I uh, limit where my uh, how, how much area my highlights take up. Yeah, right. 
Hey Bryce. Yeah, he's looking okay. He's he's uh he's coming along. We're doing some of the last bits of him now. I made my list, my my punch list, as Pendrake tells me it's called in construction, of uh all the things, all the things that need to happen. Okie dokie. So yeah, just a little little crap. Finishing up a little crap today. And then we still got the uh, the freehand golds trim and some cape touch-ups to uh, get to. Yep, triads are, uh, I mean, it was one of the earliest ideas I had for the paint line and it's still a good idea when you are uh, not comfortable, especially with mixing and such. When in doubt on small leather items, you can highlight the edges because that's where they would get more wear and tear because that the edges of a pouch are going to be more likely to rub against other things. And that pretty much brings that pouch out very nicely. You don't have to spend a lot of time on little things like this. You just want to spend enough time that you bring out the details so the detail is there. The sculptors took the time, take the time to sculpt all these beautiful small details onto models. And so this is just us kind of giving them, doffing our hats to them as we, uh, as we bring out all those little details. But it shouldn't be a main player. It's just, uh, but it's a nice detail. And so it uh, helps to augment the coolness of the figure to bring out those details. Um, some triads are too far apart, others are too close. What you, uh, what you will run into, Bryce, and the reason for it is directly related to the number of paints in the line. As time went on, um, back in the beginning, I was trying to give people as much wiggle room as I could. So like with the first purple triad, Nightshade is really different from Imperial, is really dis different from Amethyst. That's because all I had at that point was 54 colors. So I was trying to give you more options so that if you needed a light purple, you had one. And Really, the best thing then is to just do a 50-50 mix between them. But as time went on, the problem I ran into is we only had so many pigments. We only had so many paints. And when you start getting up toward 250 or 300 colors in a line, what you run into is that I want to do this triad. Oh, crap. The shadow I would do for that triad is actually a color I did back at 111, right? So then you have to essentially make colors that can still be used as a triad, but probably they're a lot closer than they were before because you can't intersect with a previous triad. So that's the challenge. And toward the end of my tenure at Reaper, I got very frustrated with it. Like doing triads was murderous because it was very, very difficult to come up with colors that highlight not just the color I could come up with but coming up with a highlight and a shadow that were different enough from previous colors for them to be different was very very hard and so that's why with later triads especially you're gonna see not as much difference as with those early triads the early triads I would say were more um like I like my original concept of what a triad should be and later triads often suffered from the oh no's. There's already um, you know there's already another golden brown here, and it does the purpose, and I don't know how I really would like to change it. Um, that's actually why the and I'm about to do a PDF on this for February, but somebody asked me to do a PDF on the copper and a mem triad. This is why the copper and a mem triad doesn't have a dark shadow in it. The reason the copper and a mem triad doesn't have a dark shadow in it is that the exact color that I would want that dark shadow to be is already in production and it's this. So essentially I decided to go rather than give you a color that was really close to russet brown, just a little bit different, I decided to go with the verdigris because I felt like we didn't have a verdigris color. Then I'd recommend just... Um, if you're, if you're on my Patreon, you can look at the pen tabs. If you are not on my Patreon, then um, just pretty much like, you know, there are other like blues that will work for each of those. I mean, any almost any dark blue you could probably go to. The light blues are a little trickier because it depends on if you want to go up warm or cool or, or grayed. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I feel you, Bryce. That's, I mean, it was a challenge in making the line. It's kind of like, it's kind of why I think that if I, if I ever got hired to design another paint line, I would want to really go out and look big picture at the whole thing. Just trying to mess around with some lines here on this, but I don't think it's going to work. Um, I'd want to go big picture on the whole thing. I would go and essentially create like a 300 color line. And then I would break that up into sections that made sense for each release so that you could still have releases over the course of several years, but your paint line overall would make sense. Um, and you could, you could see those problems with uh, colors that were too similar coming up and you could maybe address that and you'd at least have time to think about it and realize that it was a problem. So yeah, I feel you. It, it is what it is. Like I gave up on, on grumping about it in the back of my head because there was nothing I could do about it. Um, it was just the way the line developed, but I did learn from it. Don't know if I'll ever like get the opportunity to do another paint line, but if I did, I would, I would actually organize it far, far differently. Alrighty, so I got that leather. Just wanted to get the edges really picked up. I tried to do kind of the cracked leather thing. It didn't really work very well on the canteen. I mean, most of the time when you've got leather that's stretched across uh, as a canteen sling, it's actually gonna be really smooth because it's been molded on and kind of shrunk around that shape. So you, you usually don't get the t like cracks. Like with a belt, you get cracks because people are taking that belt off, they're putting it on, it's getting cinched tighter, it's changing, it's stretching. Whereas on here, the surface never changes. So you usually don't have the same kind of weathering. So all I did was kind of stip all the edges as far as the edge highlight goes. Because again, edges are always where the wear will happen. Except we can't, Turgeon. And this is what Ed would tell you, is that once those SKUs are in distribution's databases, distribution will send assassins after you, rightfully so, because if you're like, hey, we're gonna change all our SKUs, they have to go back and change all their SKUs, they are not gonna be happy with you and they will probably stop carrying your product. So that doesn't work. Much as, much as it would be awesome if it did. The only way to get that is to essentially cancel an entire paint line and reboot the whole thing. Which is, I believe, you know, could be, you know, if, it, if that happens, it, I mentioned before that Ed was probably going to like roll everything into one line at some point down the road that he warned us, right? That would be an opportunity to possibly reorg. I don't know if they will because it would take a lot of time to figure out how you were going to reorg it. Um, and they don't have an Ann on staff to like just decide to take an entire day doing that or two. Yeah, the thing is that nobody really organizes, no company really organizes its paint and color families, Cajun. We start out doing that. Like the beginning of Master Series does that. The beginning of Bones does that. But then you start, you know, your company is like, well, we need another paint release. And you're like, but, but, but. And they're like, we need another paint release. And so you put out another red because, well, red sells. Uh, and that's just the practicalities behind it. That's, that is absolutely the reason. That's what happens in business. This happens all the time. I and mean, we complain how companies do stuff that doesn't make sense, that would have made more sense if they'd like organized things a little better or done this or that. But chances are companies aren't thinking about that. They put out a product and they're like, does this product sell? And if it doesn't, well, great. Then it just like kind of sits there or it gets canceled, right? But if the product sells, then suddenly you need more product. You need new product. You need all this other stuff. And so your original plan just goes to haywire because you've got to get a new plan now. Uh, and you weren't thinking you needed any more colors, but now you do. And so that's why inevitably... Um, the only other way to do it too, the way to, uh, the other way to do it would be to organize the paint racks differently. Don't take the skews and change them, but change the paint racks so that all the reds are together, all the yellows are together, la la la. But stores hate that too, because it makes harder to, it makes it a lot harder to restock because you can't find the number. You know, you've got this box of 219217 and you have no idea where on the rack then 9217 should be. I mean, you have to stop and look at all the reds and say, okay, where is this? And it, and it costs you time. So you can see, I hope this is, this is, you know, boring business talk, but I hope you see why it's not an easy answer. 
Like, it's just not a simple thing. Because you have to think about the distributors and you have to think about the store owners. And you've got to make your product friendly to them because they're the ones who are going to buy it, right? They're going to make it available to customers. Now, as you move into a more digital age, you could argue that you don't need to pander to the distributors and the stores anymore. But that's just bad business. I mean, these people are helping keep you afloat. And if you just set out to piss them off, you're still losing money and you're still endangering your company's like future. So it's, it's never easy. Everything is always complicated. Nobody likes to hear it. We all wish it was all easy. Right. Um, there is no, there is like no chart. Like I would, you would have to have somebody go through and create a color family chart Cajun. And I think people have, I mean, doesn't paint rack do that and stuff like that. Aren't there apps for that? Um, I never had the time. Like I was the one who would have done it, but I never had the time. Like I was always producing paint. I was always having to meet quota deadlines. I was always having to, you know, create these new colors for X, Y, or Z. I was always, you know, there was just no time. And, and of all the people at Reaper, I was the one who understood color. Fa I was the artist. So yeah, right now I'll tell you, it's like, I could do it, but new paints are coming out all the time. And I no longer have access to everything here. I actually do not have every paint in the Reaper line where I am. Well, it's pretty easy, Cajun. I mean, just separate out. I mean, I do that. I've got... My paint is separated into bags by color. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. Light browns, dark browns, skin tones, neutrals and grays, off whites, and then pure whites, blacks, and, and mediums. That's how I separate it. And you can just go through your, you know, if you're using bags, like I just use gallon Ziplocs, you just go through and put all your paints on the floor and sort them all, and then you feel awesome. <laughs> That's the easiest way, really. Hello, Colin. Well, hi from the hi from uh, California. I'm I'm far away from you. We're talking about paint organization, color families, and how I designed MSP and why MSP is like less than optimal on some fronts. Purely because, as I think somebody put out, you know, um, distribution and business don't work the way that artists work. So I, that's a pretty good summary of it all. But yeah, the easiest way to put your paint in color families is just to sit down with your paint. And if you want to have like swatches of everything, that's a good opportunity to do it. Will it take you time? Yes, yes it will. Will it also give you a really good grasp of your paint collection? Yeah, yeah it will. And I would say that it's worth it in that front. I find that going any farther than just separating something into being an orange or a red, you know, or a green or a blue, um, isn't really worth it though. Like, I just need to know roughly what something is. And the more I uh, exist uh, as an artist and the more I paint, the more I go away from even using highlight colors, unless I'm going to use it for like a specific color of light. Like I do use tropical blue a lot for that when I'm doing really dim shadowy things. Um, tropical blue is there. So tropical blue plus white, or you could just go up to like it's friends in the bones uh, universe glacier. But I like to start with tropical and just bring it up with white. Um, you could just do this too. But uh but yeah, so I'm more likely, and even this is not as light as I would think it was, but I have used it to highlight black with great effect. So more and more, I go away from using light colors and using mids and darks and adding whites, off whites, yellows and things. Right, that's the thing Val, right? When you sort your paints, you, you realize how many colors you've got that you've never used, but then that's an opportunity to go, okay, what can I use this color on? And get to know that color and what it's good at. Hold on, hold on. I've got a, got a lot of talkie up here. Who's talking? Ah, Big Apple. Yeah. 
Yeah, it is a pain, but you did it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think the thing is that people weren't used to Reaper discontinuing. Like, we stopped canceling years ago, and we only started it up again last year. Um, but if you ask a game store to do that, like, if you ask Michaels to do it, Michaels Corporate can just say, okay, we're going to do this. And then they tell the stores to do it, and the stores complain, and they do it. But with a game store, a mom and pop game store... You've got, like, you have to tell the game store that. And the game store owner, who is probably one of the people who works the floor, is like, that's a pain in the ass. I hate this, right? So it's it's a little harder when you're not corporate. Yes. Also, Crows brings up an excellent point. Going through your paints like that at least gives your brain kind of, for one thing, you could get a paint the paint app, right? The paint rack app and enter in the ones you've got so that even if you don't remember it, you have a record of what paint you've bought and you won't get extras. Unless you're like me and you want 16 bottles of pure white on you at all times. Colin, if you have been out of the hobby for 20 years, boy, has it changed. Lordy sakes alive. Um, like a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, so there's so many new products. There's so many new techniques. Like you're at a great time. Don't get discouraged. The reason you're at a great time is that now, unlike when I was learning 30 years ago, yeah, um, date myself there. But unlike when I was learning, you have YouTube. <laughs> And there are so many good Patreons and there are so many good YouTube videos and there's so much Twitch. There's so many great things out there to help you with your painting so that you can get back in the saddle and you're going to get back in the saddle a lot faster than you did when you were first painting. Um, because we can make it easy for you. Like it, on this channel, especially toss a question at me. I don't care how noob it is. I will answer and I will explain why. So utilize this free thing that we are giving you. Like we will help you. We will help you become better. And I mean, I made Master Series paint and I work with mostly Master Series paint, but I also work with the Scale 75 tube colors. And I've worked with at least a little, almost every paint line that's currently available. So I can definitely still answer questions, even if it's a line that I'm not familiar with, unless it's a specific color question. Like, oh, what's an equivalent for Vallejo blue sky or whatever? I, I don't know. Um, but anyway. Why do you have all those browns? Because they're useful, Kernigo. Browns are the great neutral equalizers. Oh boy. Uh, da, 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 da. Even with paint rack you've duplicated? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, well, the chat is moving. Thank you, thank you. But yeah, um, Colin, if you have any questions, like shoot, that's that's what I'm here for. Like I paint things on this stream, sure. But I mean, I also love to answer questions. Like that's what it's here for. Um, and, and whatever question you're thinking of, don't think it's too noob or too basic or too weird or too out there. Like if you're thinking it, chances are somebody else out there is thinking it. And so you asking on the stream helps everybody else in the future. We get plenty of views on our YouTube also after this. Every stream I do here goes to the Reaper Miniatures YouTube. So if there's a miniature you like and you want to know how I did something on it, like how do we map out this freehand, all you have to do is go and watch those videos. And yeah, there'll be a lot of chat and random crap about dogs and cooking, but oh well. <laughs> And there's the Discord. Yes, Quindy says. Then there's the Discord. And if you want to paint more, you just want to get stuff painted, there's the Reaper Challenge League, which is also really fun and motivating and like non-judgmental. There you go. Yeah, Reaper Reaper is a great community. It is super friendly. It is not going to make you feel like you're like a slouch. It's not going to make you feel like you're bad. People are really encouraging here. If you want harder feedback, you really have to ask for it because, because otherwise people just want to encourage each other to paint. And that is just way cool because you know what? There's enough communities out there that are going to be hard on you when you ask them to. So having a friendly community that's no stress is just really valuable, especially if you've got any anxiety around your painting or you're thinking like it's terrible or you're not good. Or maybe you should just stop. Stuff like that. Just shut that off and go find some painting friends who just like love to paint. Quindy does have the fastest links. Alrighty, so let me see, where were we? I got all excited because we were talking. Oh yeah, I was doing the leather here. 
And there are two little things there that I could also do in gold. So I've got to remember this little catch here and I've got to remember those little details there. Unless I just want to make them like, you know, more leather, but that would be boring. Why would we do that? This model is already so freaking complicated. Let's not be boring. You're used to typing them. Yep, exactly. So I'm not highlighting the leather up too much as you see. I can, I can grab, if I wanted to take this up higher, I might go kind of yellowish with it because uh, most, yellow, most leather kind of buffs out to that tan look. You can also use skin tones to highlight leather. Um, golden skin is actually a good triad for that. <laughs> good, new model, let's not be boring, yes. <laughs> All right, let me see. So if I was gonna use like kind of a beige color, I might use Palomino Gold with some white. I might use Oxide Yellow. I might use, Blonde Hair is a good one actually. Blonde Hair makes a pretty good leather color, like for the scuffed edges where the leather is just like a pale kind of golden tan skin color. Main Crime, Impatient. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. So, my base coats, and I use a well palette. I'm one of the weirdos on the internet, Colin. A lot of people use um, wet palettes now, but I'm not a fan. I like to be able to control my paint consistency. So my base consistency is four drops of paint to one drop of water. And if you pull your brush through the paint, see how that closes up right away? That's the consistency you want. And it's okay to have a little extra paint on your brush. Just, you know, thin it a little bit. Actually, if you thin it, you can get away with putting a pretty thick coat on and it's still going to dry and not glob up details. Uh, and this is still pretty good coverage, as you can see. It's maybe like I might have to touch up a little bit, but in general, it's going to give me a good solid coat and then it's just going to take a touch up. So I seldom have to put on, sometimes I put on two thin coats if I've got a really translucent color that I'm working with for base coats. But otherwise, um, I tend to just go with four to one and one coat plus a touch up and it's good. And this is MSP. So it's not the most high coverage line in the universe. It does everything else great. Yeah, no problem. Um, and as far as, actually, you know what? I have freaking heck, I have a free video on this. Colin, <laughs> if you look up, uh, my moniker on my Patreon and YouTube is painting big, all one word. Um, if you look up, YouTube painting big, you should be able to Google it and hopefully it'll take you to my channel. I'm not, I'm not big enough on YouTube to have the YouTube slash painting big. They give me some random link instead. Um, but I just started a, a video series. They're just short little videos, like seven or eight minutes on the fundamentals of mini painting. I have one on base coats specifically and on washes. And I actually was surprised when I set out to do these because I'm, you know, a more advanced painter and I'm like, oh, base coating, this is going to be easy. But when I actually broke it down, there was a surprising amount of information about loading your brush, paint consistency, paint application, all of that stuff. So if you have time, go give it a watch. Hopefully it'll help you with your base coating. People are always surprised at how hard base coating can be, like getting a nice smooth base coat. This wasn't brought home to me until I was working at Games Workshop and I was talking to one of our regulars and he is just like, I have no idea how you get those smooth base coats. It's ridiculous how smooth your base coats are. And I'm, that's when I first started thinking about, how do I do this? <laughs> Why does this work? So I started thinking about it. Yay, good, good, good. I think Quindy might, oh yeah. And Quindy just uh, linked to my YouTube too. Cause she's awesome in the chat. So if you uh, click through and throw a follow on me, you'll be able to find me later. Or subscribe or whatever the heck they call that on YouTube. So I'm gonna grab some blonde hair just to mix a slightly higher highlight for my leather. Now, uh, where's my water? Water bottle. I'm gonna go two to one on the blonde hair because it has a lot of white in it. Yeah, I worked, I've worked for a lot of people. Um, so I essentially quit my real job. Um, when I started selling minis on eBay, I started making enough money per figure that I thought maybe I could do this for a living. So I uh, quit my real job, moved out east to Glen Burnie, Maryland, or actually up to White Marsh, but near to, near to where GW headquarters was because I was dating a guy who worked for them. Um, and I worked for them for about a year, just part-time, pretty much just to fill in the holes in my money situation. Um, 
But then when I moved back to Wisconsin after the relationship ended, I, I picked up with GW again and I worked for them at uh, one of their stores in Chicagoland. And so, yeah, I've worked for GW twice, both times part-time, relatively small. I, wor- I learned a lot um, about the hobby uh, and about the community and just, um, you know, a lot that I guess I, I kind of factor in, especially from working in the retail store. Whatever else GW does, they are pretty good at trying to make things easy for their customers on some level. Um, and just the, you know, sitting down and teaching people who were new to the hobby and trying to kind of break it down into easy steps, I think helped me later um, to like get kind of in the habit of breaking stuff down. Because, you know, you get a lot of people in the GW hobby who've never, ever done any art stuff. Ever, ever, ever. They're gamers. And they, they probably haven't ever had a paintbrush in their hands since they were six. Um, and so breaking it down and, and kind of trying to make it simple and, and to make it real clear uh, why why would you do that? Why would you do that? How does it work? I think a lot of painters, when they teach, they don't break it down that much. Like they're a lot of painters and artists. And I used to be this, like, we don't just, we don't think about how we get the results. We do, we just do it. Right. So I'm putting just a little bit of extra highlight down on some of these areas now. Oh yeah. Thanks Cranston for that. Um, the Patreon, my Patreon also has a, a PDF on how to thin master series paints. If you use them, uh, there's a free YouTube video also about that, about that. That's about an hour and a half. I did it as a class online for ReaperCon 2020 when we were all virtual, but yeah, so I quit GW when I got the job offer from Reaper. Reaper brought me down for their, um, first ever artist conference and at the end of that, they offered me a job and I was like, heck yeah. Cause I was kind of working for GW in Chicago just while I figured out what I, my next move was going to be. And I really didn't know what I was going to do. So I just knew that I, you know, if I could, I wanted to work in the hobby and that's why I was working for GW, but I wasn't necessarily happy there either. So it was great when Reaper offered me the job and I was able to go back up and tell my GW cell manager that I was going to work for the competition. <laughs> Uh, not a comfortable conversation, but, uh, still one of my favorites that I've had over the course of my life. Alrighty. So just like bringing up that highlight just a little bit more. And again, you don't want this stuff to scream at people. You just want it to be there. And if you can suggest a little texture, great, but in 28 mil, it's not necessary. I worked hard to get here, Colin. It took a long time. Like I worked full time for Reaper for 17 years. Um, I started my Patreon up in, wow, 2019, I want to say, um, right before the pandemic, which actually turned out to be excellent timing. Uh, and then when I met my now fiance out here, um, I essentially was looking for a bit of a change anyway. And uh, then I started dating David and he's also a miniature painter, but he has a, he keeps a real job. He doesn't want to do it for a living. He looks at what I go through and he's just like, I could never. <laughs> living creatively is not easy, but it can be really rewarding. So I'm glad I got here. Um, my Patreon really keeps me going. Like it is my main source of income. So I am, I am uh, happy that it is doing uh, well and generally that people like it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, all my patrons on this channel. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. It's great. We're both uh, we're both painters at a pretty high level, so we go to do competitions together. Like, we're going to go to Adepticon. He's entering Golden Demons. I'm not because I already have two Golden Demons. <laughs> so I'm going to enter, I think, Grandmaster instead. Which is actually um, another cool thing about Reaper is when I was working there, they really didn't mind. Like other companies might have gone, why are you going to enter somebody else's painting competition? But they really didn't mind if I went and competed in other people's competitions. It just really, it, it increased my visibility so that more people would come, you know, to learn from me and Reaper having me on staff would be a good thing. So 
So that was one of the one of the nice things about Reaper is that they are not snobby about the industry. They ignore they they believe that the more successful companies there are out there producing stuff, the better for everybody. And I love that mindset. I'm so happy that they have that mindset. So this is going to be gold. I'm going to take my blonde my blonde color and I'm actually going to use it because it's bright to kind of block in where I want the golds to go in places where I missed it so that I can follow up. Yeah, I mean, I don't sit here and plug other companies on the stream, but I'm if I mention one or show a model from one that I'm working on, as long as it illustrates a point, we're okay. I mean, I'm still, I still work for Reaper. I'm a part-timer now, but I still have uh, a job. So like essentially uh, April, April 1st is my 19 year anniversary with the company. I don't think there's any question that I love Reaper at this point, I guess is my point. So Reaper's not gonna get threatened if I like say, hey, I also use this paint or hey, I like this product. I still endorse an, a lot of Reaper products because having worked for the company for this long, I can tell you it is full of awesome people who really love the hobby and who try to do the best, try to do their best by the customer base. And that's, you know, you, you like to see that in a company, in any industry. Yeah, Reaper has a really good attitude. I, that was one of the things, especially coming from Games Workshop, who does not have that attitude, um, I really appreciated that attitude from Reaper when I started. It was so different from what I was used to. All right, so all these little things that need to be gold, let's just put little light color on them. And the light color will remind me to base coat. I have my gold base coat actually mixed up now, so that makes it easy after I've gone through all these. Okay, and I wanted this skull to be gold, didn't I? Yes, I did. Yeah, if you ever get a chance to come over for ReaperCon, like, you really get the sense of the company there, Colin. Um, like, yeah, Ed, Ed is our CEO. He's my boss. And he's fantastic. And Dave is his brother, and he does all the accounting. It's, it's still a family business, I mean, at its core with those two. Um, and then Ron is our art director and Adrian, his wife is our office manager and working for Reaper is like working for family. Like when you've worked there for long enough, like you just, the, the way they treat their people, like you can't do better. I don't think. Ed and Dave are always there for you. They got your back. Like in a way that few jobs have these days. So yeah, I cannot speak a single bad word about Reaper. They have treated me excellently over the course of these past almost two decades. If it wasn't that case, I still wouldn't, I wouldn't still be with them. So, but I still am. And I'm looking forward to hopefully hitting my, my, you know, my 20th anniversary next year. Never thought I would work for a single company for 20 years, by the way. Yeah, Dave even does the taxes for uh, for us employees. Dave does our taxes for free. It's one of the perks. He was actually, he was so jubilant that I was like, my taxes got so easy. <laughs> He's like, I'm so happy your taxes are going to be so easy. It's funny. It's good. If I can lower Dave's stress levels, that's great. I'm going to also undercoat these areas because I was thinking about making them orange. So when you're going to use a transparent bright color like this orange um, on any area that's kind of already like maybe dark. Oh, and I missed that leather strap right there, guys. See, it didn't make it on my list. <laughs> Do I get a gold paintbrush? But yeah, when you're going to do a light, uh, a bright color, put down white or something off white first. It'll make it a lot easier for it to cover. It's hard to build up coverage with bright colors over black or dark color. So even if you use black primer, it's cool. Just um, do some white underpainting over areas that you want a light or bright color to go over. It will make it a lot easier for you. Well, there, at least I remember that leather strap. Now I can actually highlight it real quick before we move on to this orange and the gold. 
<laughs> you wish. <laughs> Dave gets stressed out at tax season, so I, I would not wish that upon him. There are too many Reaper customers. Dave would have to start a whole new company just for taxes at that point. All right, so we've got that blocked in gold. I'm going to go through and get the rest of this stuff blocked in gold. My gold base coat is, as always, everybody knows, everybody repeat, rich leather. It's a lovely, lovely base color for NMM gold. You can also use NMM gold shadow itself, although I'd never, the reason I end up using rich leather all the time is that I don't, I just don't have NMM gold shadow like sitting on my plate because I use this color for other things and it's close enough. So NMM Gold Shadow works, uh, Rich Leather works. I definitely start with the shadow on gold. Not the darkest shadow, but kind of the mid shadow. Because uh, I want a richness to it. I see When I start with a, a brighter yellow or ochre, I find that it gets too yellow, too cartoony. Um, so I like to start with the darker colors and layer up the gold over the top. I find it gives the gold more depth. Makes it more like gold, less like yellow. <laughs> you just figured out how to make Dave more grumpy. <laughs> wow, I didn't know that could happen. <laughs> Dave is our grumpy cat. Though he's a dog person, so he'd be a grumpy dog. All right, I'm gonna actually mix some uh, some of this rich leather with my driftwood and my blonde to get kind of this intermediate kind of golden brown color. And I'm gonna pop it on the, remember I mentioned that we could use the driftwood as um, base coat for these uh, little teeth. The little fangs on the necklace. And then we can bring in uh, some bleached linen or something, even, even pure white, although probably I'll use bleached linen um, because I believe I was using bleach linen with a little pure white to pop the horns up here in this. This gives us another place to repeat our parchment color that we've got on the bones, on this little, uh, little scroll, um, on the horns. So even though these tiny teeth are tiny, they still give us a chance to repeat that kind of, uh, color untone on the model. All right, let's see here. Did I get it all? I think I did. I need to highlight that leather strap. This is really just to go through the bucket list of what we have left to do. But once again, you don't have to like do a lot on each of these items. You just really need to kind of hit them with a highlight and then a second highlight and then you're good. Move on. Yeah, imposing Dave is scary Dave. But Dave is really a great guy. So you just always have to hold that in your head when you're working with him. And when in doubt, if you if you must divert, um, whip out a picture of a cute dog, you'll be good. Dave loves dogs. Alrighty, so we're pretty good there. We're pretty good there. I do have these rivets that I totally did not do before. See, as you as you paint, as you go over your list, you keep hitting things that you've forgotten when you're working on a model that's this freaking complicated. This is the problem with really busy minis, is that every time you look at it, you see something else, like these little rivets on his armband that I missed the first time. So take your time, roll your eyes a little bit when you've, find yet the fifth thing that you've forgotten and missed and then just deal with it. So I'm underpainting with this uh, blonde color real quick and then I'm gonna put the base coat over the top of it. If I tried to put the rich leather color over the top of the black, it would just disappear because that color is a little translucent and it would not stand out. But just putting a quick coat of this lighter color, this off-white essentially, first means that I will be able to put that rich leather down and it will show up just fine. 
This is underpainting. I do this technique all the time to make lighter colors stand out on top of darker ones. What paint colors does Reaper need for Bone 6? No one has asked me, Crows. Ron is doing the designs. Um, I would probably like want the Oops All Berries triad that, uh, that Sadie kind of concepted. Uh, I would like, um, with that, with that raspberry color we mixed, uh, there's a like red, really rich red brown color. If I had to do it, honestly, if I was still working for Reaper at this point in my life, I would try to duplicate some artist colors that we don't have. That's one of my, my upcoming handouts for the Patreon, by the way, is, is um, artist tube equivalencies and MSP. Because a lot of people are starting to use traditional art books, especially like, like portraiture books and stuff, to get recipes for like skin tones. And it'll help a lot if I can give people an equivalent for raw umber or an equivalent for El Elizar and Crimson or an equivalent for X or Y or Z, you know. So, so I, if it were me, I would probably start aiming for those artist colors that we don't have yet. Because I think that as the hobby matures, more and more people, as they learn more, as they, as they get more comfortable with mixing, more and more people will reach for pure pigment colors. They'll be referring to standard art books. They'll be saying, you know, what the heck is, you know, the equivalent for Rose Matter, you know, they're going to be all that. Like, and so I want, I would, I, since we haven't ever done that, that would be something I would do. It's the same reason I put the oxides out. Uh, the edge here, this is sculpted, and I actually need to still go in and do the runes. Actually, thanks for that reminder, Colin. Yeah, I need, there is quite a bit. We'll have at least one more stream. I'll probably do a lot of gold next stream, because I've done a lot of other touch-ups on this stream. Uh, let's see here. I wanted to put down runes on Cloak Edge. I'll definitely have to rewrite this punch list. Because I've gotten uh, so many reminders of other things. But boy, he's looking so nice, isn't he, guys? His front at least looks done. Almost. There's just a few things. But he's so busy that you, don't, you hardly even notice the things that aren't done. And then we, we have a lot to do back here. But still, I'm uh, pretty happy with him. Yes, yes. When you're teaching to a bunch of hyperactive gamer kids, that is hard. Yeah, you're you're in, dog father. You're in. All righty. Uh, that's right. I was going to maybe go blue here and orange there. I think I'm going to hold on that. I think I am going to get out my bleached linen to put some highlights on. I need a yellow to highlight my gold with. But you know what, teaching kids, I mean, even if it, they don't like do much with it right away, they have a hobby then that they can come back to in the future. And I see so many people do that. I mean, Colin is an example, right? You got, you stuck out of, you got out of the hobby for like 20 years and then you came back around to it. There are so many people who do that. It's like you get through being an adult and you're like, God, I need a way to detox. And then you remember that you used to have a lot of fun painting these models. And then you look and you're like, holy crap, people are doing amazing things with miniatures these days. And then you're back. Then you're back. And oh my gosh, we are so spoiled nowadays. With the 3D printing, Colin, and so many like single artists and small shops putting out great like sculpts that you can just print yourself if you've got a printer. Or if you're me, you buy them off Etsy. <laughs> Um, or, and you consider getting a 3d printer of your own, but we haven't gone down that bunny, bunny hole yet. Um, David bring, brought it up the other day and I'm like, well, which of us is going to learn to use the dang thing? And he's like, eh. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so we haven't, we haven't bunny holed that yet, but even without the 3d printing, it's also making uh, it more easy for small shops to like do their own sculpts and print them and fulfill them. Um, and so 
it just, there's so much amazing out in the hobby these days. So much amazing. Every time I look online, every time I go to my supplies talk channel on my Patreon, which is really the enablement channel, um, and somebody's posted up a new Kickstarter or a new model that just went up, I just get all excited because there's so much good stuff. So it is an exciting time to be returning to the hobby. You have so many options for paint. You have so many options for education. You have so many options for amazing new models. So welcome back. Yeah, there we go. My lantern yellow is getting exhausted and it was definitely not um, having a fun there. So, so lantern yellow, very, very yellow, orangey yellow. I like to use orangey, orangey yellows for gold. Um, I'm gonna grab and put some pure white in that to kind of bleach it out just a little because we don't want it that yellow. Pure white's really strong, so it'll take it lighter. I'm gonna pop a couple of drops of water in there. And also I'm gonna grab a brush full of my rich leather because I wanna tone it down just a little bit. Now I can keep this brighter if I want because all these little things I'm about to put like highlights on are so small. You can go brighter yellow with your gold when you have really small surfaces to work on. Now we can see it again. There we go, all right. At least miniature painting you can scale up if you want, Cajun. And the miniature painting also has the, uh, the advantage, which many hobbies do not, that you can turn around and sell the stuff you've painted and make back at least a little of your cash. So I feel, I feel like I, I can, I mean, as an, as an artist, I'll tell you, starting from the 2D world and also talking to a lot of friends in the 2D world is not every hobby that lets you do that effectively, but you can make a fair, decent part-time job out of painting minis without stressing yourself too much. Um, not so much, Cajun. And the reason, everybody's all like, why isn't there a market in terrain pieces? And la la la, there's got to be people looking for them. People are looking for terrain, but they're looking for super cheap terrain. So making money off of terrain, really difficult. Plus shipping them can get problematic. Um, and people feel like they can do it themselves a lot of the time. I personally actually enjoy painting terrain. I think a lot of people do. And so I would never probably buy uh, a, an expensive painted piece. And that's the other thing is the amount of work that goes into the terrain usually means you have to price it up to the point where people really won't buy it. More and more companies um, have kind of discovered this. There are still terrain companies out there, but I've seen so many fail. So now I'm using these yellows to uh, put highlights on my little gold bits. Just a little highlight, little speck. And this is where having a good brush and thinning your paint really comes in. Um, you want thin paint, but you want very little bit on the brush. You can see how little I have, and you can see my brush still comes to a really, really good point. That's the key. If you don't see that fine of a tip on your good sable brush when you're uh, unloading it, keep unloading. And if you're impatient, kind of like try to find your love of the process. Like find some joy in just getting better and in painting and in relaxing instead of just finishing things. There's also great joy in finishing things and I'm getting back into that as, I'm, as I tune some efforts of mine to make me a paint faster and more lately. But it's easy to get just too impatient. When you're, when you're really impatient, it's hard to enjoy the hobby. Mini painting can be so relaxing when you get in the zone. Hey there, Luca, how's it going? Yeah, it's almost time. It's the alpaca reminder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we used to have Dwarven Forge and I just never painted it like back in my old, my old life. Um, it's just, there's so much of it. I love painting terrain, but finding time for it is hard for me. Unless if I'm gaming, if I actually am gaming, then I'm motivated to paint terrain because then we can actually use it like the next, you know, the next week. Um, we can actually like have some use of it. 
But otherwise, I love, I've got some beautiful buildings, but I just never make time to paint them because especially now, you know, with pandemic land, um, there's just, there's just no reason I'm not using them. Although as we uh, get our paint club back together um, out here, our real life paint club, maybe we'll actually get some gaming in. I know at least one of, of our people actually plays like 40k and other stuff. So it might be fun to actually start gaming again. Yeah. Yeah, that's getting in the zone. That's so nice, Colin, isn't it? I love that. Like, like you get tired at the end of that. But the nice thing about mini painting is you have something to show for it. Like, you've got this great model that hopefully you really enjoy and that you're happy with. And that's really, like, something to remember is to, like, keep your joy in the hobby. Don't stress about it. If you keep trying and you keep painting, you will get better. And if you run into a wall and you're like, I don't know what's what's you know what's going on here, and I don't know how I can get better, there are so many people like me, like like others who can help you out, um, out on the, in the digital universe. So, and there are excellent Patreons. Patreon is a great resource for mini painters. There's a lot of excellent painters, not just myself, but but like Miniature Monthly and Ben Comets and um, Sergio um, Calvo Rubio in Spain. Like so many uh, really good painters have Patreons because, you know, we all try to live creative lives and, and Patreon is really a game changer if you want to live creatively. It really helps us all. There's a reason so many painters are using it. So even if you don't want it or have the money, um, you can just go to YouTube and get a lot of free instruction there too. <laughs> so faces, yeah, all right. Um, probably the key, what a lot of people don't do is they, they don't shade. Like this guy doesn't have a really good face for it, but do I have a good face right now? I don't. Everybody's got facial hair. Um, eh, eh. I think the only person who is actually a person that we've done recently is uh, Lisette. So when you do faces, let's do it quick. I put my base on. I usually start dark with face with skin tones, not just with hers. I mean, she is a dark skinned person, but even with regular like Caucasian skin tones, I'll start with say tanned skin, which is arg. Uh, do I have it? No, it's in the other room. Oh no, but um, but with a, a kind of a little bit of a darker Caucasian skin tone. And then I bring it up from there. Pay attention to where light falls on faces. If you look at my face in this lighting right now, you're gonna see light on my brow, light on my forehead, light on my nose, light on my upper lip and light on my chin. What do I have here? Light on my brow, light on my forehead, light on cheekbones, nose, upper lip, and chin. And don't forget shadows. Under the cheekbone, under the eye sockets, under the bottom of the nose. Even just doing one layer of highlighting and shading on 28 millimeter faces makes everything come out so much more. Yeah, I would start, like, whatever skin tone you're looking at, darken it. Like, I usually use, like, a reddish brown to bring it down, or I'll, or I'll use russet brown to bring it down. Um, some You don't want to use anything with a lot of black in it, though. Try to look for, like, reddish brown colors that don't, don't like, if you, if you add it to your skin tone and it kind of goes ashy, then you're dealing with black pigment. So it, you have to be kind of selective. But if you have a dark Caucasian, like, kind of, like, more uh, a tanned skin color, Start with that and then bring it up more into the highlights. I do not use washes. I think they make more work, make more work than they solve because then I have to go back over the surface and I hate doing that. I used to use washes a lot, a lot, a lot. And then I realized that I was painting faster without them. So instead I just paint them in. Also I line, I use a dark liner. You can see the line right there around her face to separate the hair from the face and to, to add that shadow. Cause if you look at my hair right here, you can see that dark shadow like going up here. So you're just mimicking what you see in real life. Look at pictures, look at photographs of people. 
If you find that your washes kind of make everything dirty and that you hate going back over the surfaces, then yeah, avoid washes. Just try to paint with layering. I mean, mix up your wash, but then just use it to paint the shadows where you want them, like we did here on the green. But yeah, that's the faces. It's like, it's just like, make sure you've got shadows and highlights. If you even do one layer of shadows and highlights and you pay attention to the placement, your faces will already look far better. Yeah, he's not as good of an example because his he's got facial hair, but... Alrighty, it's 11. It is Alpaca Nation time, folks. So what we did today, I'll just have to make up a little time tomorrow. Um, what we did today is we put a lot of little gold touches on the model that we had forgotten before. We did uh, leather. Um, we, we pretty much went around. We made our punch list of things that we need to do. And now I'm going to mark off the stuff that I've already done and probably rewrite the list so it's clearer for next time. Uh, and yeah, we talked just an awful lot about the biz, the biz of painting, sorting your paints. Why, what happens when paint freezes? Why does it wreck it? Uh, back at the beginning and stuff like that. So yes, thank you everybody. Uh, <laughs> just, just checking on crows. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody. Have a fantastic day tomorrow. Tomorrow is bus today. Do, do, do. The bust comes back and maybe we'll actually get to the skin tones this time to lightening up the skin tones speaking of faces um so yes thank you all for showing up it was a fun stream i hardly noticed the time go by so have a great one everybody tomorrow is bust day i will see you then i'm not going to hold up luca anymore i hope you enjoy the rest of your wednesday we'll see you tomorrow morning Bye bye